So welcome everyone uh, to the panel and uh, to our audience on Facebook and Twitter. My name is Magdalena Kirchner. I'm the country director of Afghanistan for the German Friedrich Ebert Foundation, a nonprofit active in more than 100 countries since 1925. Uh, luckily, we are active in uh, the US, in Afghanistan and in Uzbekistan. So I'm especially thrilled to have the honor to moderate this panel. Um, on behalf of the Afghan Institute for Strategic Studies. Um, our topic today is very positively framed. It's about the prospect of cooperation between Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and the United States. We'll have a lot of potential to discuss, but I'm sure we will also reach some more difficult questions, especially on how to put uh, our good ideas and initiatives on track. I'm very, very excited that we have a great panel of experts for this discussion and an opportunity for an international audience to engage on Facebook and Twitter. Before we'll kick off the meeting, I would uh, kindly ask my colleague to start the a Sufi prayer so we can imagine we will be at AS, IASS and have uh, our usual procedure. Thank you. <laughs> I bo mano pin hon chudil, I still salom at me kunam. Tu kabai, harjor bam, I still mukom at me kunam. So ho rahni rabi, chun mohaye dar dastin man. Gar sol ho rah mi rabi chun mohraye dar dast man Chize ke romash mi kuni Son chiz romat mi kuna It's finished. <laughs> Thank you. So welcome back to our panel and uh, some opening remarks. First, uh, some housekeeping for everybody who's also joining us. Um, well, thankfully to COVID, one might say uh, worldwide. You have, uh, of course, the, the opportunity to, in, to engage with our panel live on Facebook and Twitter through the AISS channels. I would Likely, I would like to ask you to put questions there um, and if possible, direct them to, um, to a speaker so we can easily integrate it into our conversation here. So the floor will also be yours. We will start with some uh, opening remarks from the, from the panel, but then I think this topic has like a wide reach of, of questions that we should, should discuss, especially it as it affects so many of the current dynamics that we're observing in both, uh, in all of these countries that we're discussing today and especially their, um, their relations. So coming to this, um, luckily as a moderator, your job is especially to ask questions and be the lead learner, which is my role today. I would like to introduce briefly the speakers and then invite them to, um, to give their opening remarks, but maybe just from an observing uh, position, some thoughts on why I think um, this is especially timely and I'd like to congratulate AISS on coming up with this issue. Because what we see in looking at this triangle, we actually see four narratives of change, of new developments that are very fascinating and of course intertwined. The first narrative of change that we see is of course what's happening in Afghanistan, around Afghanistan in the last two years, maybe the biggest chance that we had so far to come to a political settlement. And there is a wide consensus that without regional buy-in, without international support, this cannot be achieved. So how do the domestic developments in Afghanistan actually invite engagement from the region? Where do we stand five months after the Doha agreement in coming to an actual consolidation 
of a negotiation that could then be support uh, supported by the regional powers. I think this is the first um, the first thread of interest from my side. The second, of course, also on the other side of the border in Uzbekistan, a lot has changed in the last years uh, since 2016. With the new president, there has been well, sort of an opening, specially recognized also by extra regional powers. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of initiatives driven by Uzbekistan in the region, not only on, on Afghanistan. So we do have maybe a new Uzbek foreign policy and it's, I think it will be very interesting to learn more about this. Thirdly, we have well a US policy that is well somewhat traditional in the region, but also has new aspects. I think most prominently a new Central Asian uh, strategy, a Central Asia strategy, um, where the US is trying to both adjust to their interest in Afghanistan, but I think, and uh, I think our speakers will agree, that Afghanistan is not the only reason why the US has an interest in uh, being engaged in Central Asia, but certainly we have some new developments that are very interesting uh, to discuss. And the fourth, of course, this triangle is not happening in a vacuum. There are extra regional powers um, that do have an interest in seeing how this triangle um, might form, what will be the institutional consequences of it? Do we see a rivalry? Is this a platform for cooperation or could there be a competition between the many triangles and initiatives that we see in the past years um, inviting cooperation? So these would be, um, I think, the four pillars that I would like to structure the discussion around it. We will hear, I am very sure, on all of these points from our esteemed speakers. And then we will have a discussion where we can uh, discuss it. And I think what also um, AISS asks us is to come to some form of recommendations um, to players. As I said in the beginning, a lot of this uh, a lot of developments are in flux. We have uh, yet still the institutions to build and to find that can carry this process forward. So I think it would be also be very rich if we can get some of the recommendations from the panel and discuss also the ideas of, um, of the audience. I would like to invite first Don, uh, Dr. Jennifer Murtazashvili uh, to, uh, to the panel to give us her opening remarks. She's the Associate Professor and Director of International Development, uh, Director of the International Development Program at the Graduate School of Pittsburgh, um, at the University of Pittsburgh at the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Um, she's a well-known scholar on Afghanistan. Um, and I think I said with the COVID crisis, we are separated from each other, but we also have the chance to have a global discussion, and at the same time, a very local discussion, because the panelists that we have know the, the earth quite well that we talk about. Um, Dr. Murtazashvili has a lot of field research experience, both in, in Afghanistan and in Uzbekistan, and has the chance to actually tell us something about the perceptions, mutual understandings of the people on the ground. But she also has a lot of experience as a policy expert um, and certainly some things to tell about the, the institution building that needs to be done um, to make this uh, initiative actually um, a real one. So, Jen, without further ado, I would like you to, uh, to start with your opening remarks, and I'm looking forward to this. Thank you very much. Um, and th those are very kind words. And I should just say that for any of us who are looking at this region, we're always students. Um, and there's so much for us to learn and to understand. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. And this is very exciting for me because Uzbekistan, Afghanistan are places that I love very dearly. I lived in Uzbekistan for five years uh, before I went to graduate school. Uh, and after um, 2005, um, I focused primarily uh, on Afghanistan, and I, I'll talk a little bit about why later. Um, but I just want to say that it's really difficult to have these discussions today without really thinking about the current global pandemic that's affecting so many of us, so many of our families here in the United States and Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. You know, my heart breaks when I just see so much suffering. Um, and so these issues that we're going to discuss today about regional cooperation are extremely important. And they're taking place in this really changing environment. 
Um, and I think there's a lot of positive momentum that we can take away from this discussion. And it's a real, it's a real opportunity for constructive dialogue. Um, the U.S. is really engaged in the peace process. Um, we're seeing dramatic changes within Uzbekistan, and we're also seeing a new U.S. strategy evolve towards Central Asia. I'm going to begin this discussion actually by talking about Uzbekistan and the incredible changes that have taken place there over the past several years. And these changes are really possible because of after the death of Islam Karimov in, in 2016, um, the previous government really did not want to have much to do with Afghanistan. And he really visualized the country as a threat. And th this has changed dramatically. It's changed how Uzbekistan perceives Afghanistan. And it's actually changed how many people in Afghanistan perceive Uzbekistan. And I would argue that Uzbek's foreign policy has been one of the country's greatest successes in the past few years. The country's really opened itself up to outsiders, um, to its immediate neighbors, most importantly. So it, it wasn't just Afghanistan that it saw as a threat, it was all of its neighbors. So there was very closed relations among all of them. And these domestic changes inside of Uzbekistan had really transformed regional possibilities. So not only are we seeing greater economic um, cooperation, we're seeing Uzbekistan support things like hydroelectric power um, in Tajikistan, something that was really unheard of before. And the, this regional cooperation, I think, has enormous potential to um, propel regional projects like CASA 1000 or the TAPI uh, pipeline, which have been really on hold for many years. Um, but one thing that has really remained unchanged is the sort of the central tenet of Uzbek foreign policy. And that is this issue of uh, a multi-vectored foreign policy and non-interference in its neighbors. And non, uh, this non-interference position means that the Uzbek government traditionally has not gotten involved with Uzbek diaspora communities beyond its borders, whether they're in Tajikistan, whether they're in Kyrgyzstan, or whether they're in Uzbek and Afghanistan. And the multi-vectored approach means that um, Uzbekistan wishes to be independent and sovereign. This is not new. This is actually a tenet of Karimov's foreign policy. But what's new about the new approach is that a multi-vectored approach means that it, the country will not be closed to all of its neighbors, but actually open and embrace them. So it's multi-vectored and independent. So this new foreign policy is really transforming, I think, Uzbekistan into Central Asia, Asia's regional hub. By opening up its borders and welcoming the world, it's actually changing hearts. And this also means that Uzbekistan, uh, by opening itself up, is actually integrating Afghanistan more into Central Asia's foreign policy and into the Central Asian community. So rather than seeing Afghanistan as sort of this appendage to Central Asia, there is a real possibility to integrate Afghanistan into Central Asia. And so this is a huge achievement. Um, and so the fact that Uzbekistan is really changing its position um, is having dramatic effects. So I was just in both Afghanistan and Uzbekistan in February, and I can't tell you the changes that I've seen, especially in Kabul. You know, 10 years ago in Kabul, people didn't think about Uzbekistan very much. Um, there wasn't a lot of familiarity with it. And in fact, when I would talk to people about it, they often thought I was talking about Tajikistan. Um, there was some appreciation for the power, uh, the power lines that Uzbekistan brought into Kabul, you know, around 2007. Um, but today, many Afghans are traveling to Tashkent. They're doing business there. Um, and many people are seeing Uzbekistan as a potential model for them to follow. On the other side of the Amu Darya, Uzbeks are actually not very familiar with Afghanistan at all. And unfortunately, many of the stereotypes um, surround that, that are related to security um, really fill the minds of most people. Many prominent um, scholars of Afghanistan inside of Uzbekistan have actually never had the chance to travel. So the travel, you're seeing many more Afghans traveling to Uzbekistan than vice versa, and hopefully this will change. Um, so the big question is within this changing dynamics within the region, how does US policy fit in all of this? And so my comments here are really focused on the economic issues. I know Dr. Shahrani is gonna talk about many of the security issues. 
Um, but recently, the U.S. did release a new foreign policy strategy towards Central Asia, and it reiterated what it has for the past, you know, 20 years, which is that the U.S. supports sovereignty and self-determination in all of the countries in Central Asia. And this means that there's an expectation from the U.S. that expects other countries to include Central Asian leaders in all negotiations. Um, so really not going above anyone's heads or negotiating on issues um, without their consent. So this is, this change is important. Um, I mean, this is not a change, but one of the changes that, that is very important is that, you know, for the past 15 years or so, the United States has seen Central Asia, the five former Soviet Central Asian republics, really as um, a side to its Afghan strategy. And so in this sense, um, Central Asia was about transit routes, it was about a new Silk Road strategy, it was about northern distribution networks, it was about security, and it, there was very little consideration of how you take these five republics and make them part of a broader strategy. In 2015, the Obama administration um, launched this uh, C5 plus one process, which created this new body that integrated the five Central Asian republics. Um, but I think it was really unfortunate that that process at that time did not include Afghanistan as one of the key members, sort of as a C6. And many people have made this argument. Um, but one of the really interesting things that we've seen is in May of this year, the U.S. actually launched a new three-way dialogue between Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and the U.S. And um, this was sort of unexpected, um, and it's a very positive move, and it could be something that the U.S. does with other countries in the region, um, such as Tajikistan. Uh, but this is really helping the Afghans and the Uzbeks address technical issues that can spur greater regional cooperation, especially on economic and security issues. Um, so these better relations um, will really help Uzbekistan move beyond isolationist policies and increase foreign investment, um, which is really its goal. The United States is obviously wary of China and its Belt and Road initiatives um, and concerned about how this is going to play out in Central Asia and in Afghanistan. Um, and we're beginning to see sort of these sovereignty issues wither away in places like Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, where uh, these two countries have enormous amounts of debt to China, and their sovereignty may be in question uh, because of these relations. And in fact, uh, it's, it's very well known that uh, China and Tajikistan do have very close security relations, and there's questions about whether actually China, uh, Tajikistan has ceded some of its territory and security um, to China. So after the withdrawal of the US from Afghanistan, we do expect to see decreased interest from the US in the region. And that's, I think, a matter of, um, you know, the course of the, of the two decades of war. The US has promised investment into Uzbekistan. It has promised to maintain its relationship with Afghanistan, but really the U.S. has not put a lot behind uh, in terms of investments behind these relations. So it remains to be seen whether this new U.S. strategy that does embrace a greater Central Asia, that does create a space for more cooperation between Uzbekistan and Afghanistan will really be supported. So future investments in Afghanistan also really remain uh, very uncertain given the COVID crisis and um, the uncertainty of future U.S. assistance to Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. But something is very clear, is that the U.S. can facilitate greater cooperation between the two, but with or without the United States, it does seem that relations between Afghanistan and Uzbekistan are on a very positive trajectory. Um, and the Uzbeks are seeing increased trade, increased opportunities for investment um, as ways to leverage this foreign policy so that Afghanistan is actually seen as a central hub, as a central um, access point for greater trade than it has in the past when the country issued most forms of trade. This will have an enormously transformative um, effect on the region, and I'm really optimistic about the relations between these two countries and where they go. Now, I know I didn't talk about the really important issues of security, 
And I'm going to leave that to Dr. Shahrani to address in his comments. Thank you so much, Jen, especially for, I think, the positive um, opening of the of the tableau. I think uh, what we took away especially was like the lot of the huge potential and I think also the openness on the side of the people and of course I'd like to in the course of our discussion come back on what could be um, impediments and uh, maybe underlying underlying uh, conflicts here. As you rightfully introduced the uh, Dr. Shahrani uh, as the next speaker I think it makes like perfect sense uh, to, to continue with like this idea of the, what are actually the factors important for the bilateral relations and where does also US interest comes in that has, as was said before, both a security lag and an economic perspective, um, maybe postponing the geopolitical aspects to, to a later stage of the discussion. Um, Dr. Nazif Sharani, he's also a professor of anthropology, which you can see from the huge amount of books behind him in this, in this session. Um, he's a professor uh, for Central Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the Indiana University in Bloomington. Um, he holds an uncountable number of uh, fellowships and awards. He received a PhD from the University of Washington, uh, Seattle, and is also an anthropologist focusing on Central Asia for many decades. Um, I think what is very interesting also for the audience to know this is that uh, Dr. Sharani also has a history of research on one of the most crucial topics uh, when we look through the security lens um, on the region that is the uh, radicalization and uh, Islamic movements and, and terrorist organizations that are also at the heart of the Doha agreement and probably also one of the factor why the region, uh, why regional actors are interested in what's actually going to play out uh, in, the, in the settlement and how does that contribute to stability or will these issues remain something on the, on the transnational agenda. So I would ask uh, Dr. Sharani to tell us a bit more also about the, the historical development. I think what, what Jen also outlined is perception of Afghanistan as a threat um, and how did, especially before 2001, uh, this perception actually translates into policy. Um, and then we have the second juncture that was also mentioned, the change of, of presidents in, in Uzbekistan. But um, if there's time, if not, we can discuss it later, of course. Please also tell us a bit about your view on the challenge of, of transnational terrorism, uh, especially in northern Afghanistan, which I think is, is very much on the focus of the observers. Dr. Sharani, I, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, Bismillah rahman rahim and salam alaikum to all of you, um, both uh, to the guests who are part of the panel, as well as uh, those who are listening to us. It's a pleasure to be with you guys, but uh, let me uh, declare that I'm not an expert. I hate the word expert. Uh, concerning uh, <laughs> our effort, we are students of, um, you know, study of, in my case, Afghanistan and certainly Uzbekistan. I have uh, had my heart in Central Asia in terms of my professional interests besides my home country, Afghanistan, all my life. But I wasn't able to go to Uzbekistan until 1992 after Uzbek independence. And I've spent all together about a year doing research, including in 1994, a six month on Fulbright faculty scholarship. And main areas of my interest in the area was really Islamic um, retention of Islam under Soviet rule and the rule of family, uh, Uzbek families in, in doing so. But I also was very much interested in, in the Islamic movements um, that uh, emerged at the end of Prestroika or at the beginning of Prestroika and then continued in what happened to that. And then my talk will be also to some extent focused on that particular issue. Let me say that um, uh, the topic, of course, is relationships between these three countries, US, uh, Uzbekistan, and the United States. I would uh, speak less about the US part, other people will cover it, but Afghanistan and Central Asia initially. Afghanistan, didn't, there was no Uzbekistan until 1991 to speak of for, uh, is a reality. 
Uh, relationship before uh, Uzbek independence between Afghanistan uh, and Central Asia was very negative. Um, Afghanistan uh, had, in fact, betrayed in the 1920s the uh, so-called Basmachi movement, which was a jihad movement against the Soviet Union. The um, Amanullah regime, as well as Nader Khan's regime, um, sided with the Bolsheviks and uh, they were responsible for the decimation of the jihad movement in Central Asia. So um, uh, the relationship to, to speak in terms of state people relationship is a very negative one. The uh, next one, of course, was the invasion of Soviet Union of Afghanistan in using and abusing Muslim Central Asian Republican soldiers to be part of the invasion and it had its own consequences. So um, that part really is, is a very unfortunate uh, relationship uh, based on, on deception and based on abuse, um, particularly on the part of Soviet Union, as well as the Afghan government towards the people of Central Asia. The treatment of uh, the Amir of Bukhara and his uh, community in Afghanistan is a shameful one. That has not been really discussed very much in the Afghan history, but it needs to be in the future to unpack what is going on. Let me uh, turn to the independent Uzbekistan, and that is um, with the presidency of Islam Karimov, which unfortunately uh, turned into a security regime, a police regime um, that um, uh, talked a great deal about uh, security and his concerns about security. Uh, and there, Afghanistan became a sort of a justification for much of his hardline policies within Uzbekistan. And in fact, one of the lines, I should say, uh, since 1992, I was there, and uh, 94, and then many more trips in between. And my last visit was uh, 2018, when I taught for about a week at uh, Andijan Daulat University and then traveled on land to see. So I've seen sort of um, the early um, regime's impact on society as well as the, the uh, last three and a half years under President um, uh, Mirziyayev. So let me say that um, the abuse that uh, Afghanistan became uh, for, or object of abuse, I should say, to promote his own policies during um, uh, President Islam Karimov's era was very unfortunate because Afghanistan was, as uh, Jan suggested, was presented as a place of fear, a place where narcotics uh, were, you know, pervasive and, of course, radical um, Islamism, and uh, it was nothing but a bag of threats from the south. And uh, that, unfortunately, also produced the radical Islam within Uzbekistan. The early Islamic movement in Uzbekistan was very peaceful. The Namangan uh, event of 1992 was extremely peaceful. And of course, the government took a very hard line uh, um, uh, approach towards that. And that, of course, drove um, Namangani uh, and uh, Tahir Yuldosh out, um, essentially, to join the uh, there was no space, there was no place left for them in Uzbekistan, so that they came to Tajikistan and joined the Tajik civil war on the Islamist side, on the uh, Rastakhez movement and other things. And then they fought there for a while and eventually they were driven out of uh, Tajikistan and they came to Afghanistan. This was the time when Taliban had begun to invade northern Afghanistan from the south. And of course, there was the Northern Alliance movement. And Northern Alliance had been also forced to rely to some extent to Uzbekistan and Central Asian Republics plus Russia, along with their allies, to um, uh, fight their war against the ISI-driven invasion of Northern Afghanistan by Taliban. And in that context, for Muslim uh, Central Asian fighters who had been forced out of their own country to Tajikistan and now to Afghanistan, they could not stay in Northern Afghanistan because the government would not permit uh, or would not uh, um, allow his allies to give them home. 
So they sort of fell in the lap of the Taliban. The um, militant Central Asian Muslims essentially uh, by default came to be allies of Taliban and they became the best allies of them because they had no place to go. And then of course, uh, eventually uh, they fought with the Taliban, uh, fought against their own people in Northern Afghanistan, which was unbelievable that Uzbek fighters, Tajik fighters were fighting with the Taliban against the Uzbeks and Tajiks and Turkmen in Northern Afghanistan. And that, of course, was the most unfortunate development in Afghan Central Asian uh, relationships uh, to us. And then, of course, what happened was that once the American intervention came, all of them were now driven outside of Afghanistan into the lap of ISI in Northwestern Pakistan. And it's there that the split came and Tahir Yuldoshov was, was killed um, in the American invasion in Northern Afghanistan. And um, Namangani um, uh, was killed later in Pakistan by mo most likely by, pa by Pakistani ISI or by Pakistani Taliban. And that of course led also to factionalization within the militant Uzbek, um, what, they, what they called IMU, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan. Um, and ideological differences came and they, some of them split to join Daesh. And in fact, some of them even traveled from Central Asia as well as from uh, uh, Pakistan into Syria to fight in the Syrian war. But ultimately what happened of course was that the Uzbeks got um, decimated by ISI and by Pakistani Taliban, several hundred of them were killed in nine, uh, 2016, uh, 2015, 2016 in, in Waziristan. And then others have been sort of um, unwilling but necessary uh, dependents on Taliban and Al Qaeda. And this is the issue that I want to uh, uh, make a suggestion because one of the questions that was raised was what could we suggest? for this trilateral arrangement or platform of the United States, Uzbekistan and Afghanistan that could do uh, in, in terms of uh, programmatic things. Um, from what I heard yesterday, um, I joined a program that the uh, uh, ambassador of Uzbekistan in Washington DC, Ambassador Wahabov was giving for the Central Asia program of the Johns Hopkins University. And he was uh, suggesting that this trilateral platform had been created and its first meeting was held in 2019 in February. And the second was apparently held just two days ago in which um, the foreign minister Atmar and um, the Uzbek foreign minister and undersecretary from the US had been um, involved in that. In that they have created apparently three working committees one on economics, which has been of course discussed and then another one on political, which is really more regional sort of alliances and, and you know, what US's interest is in that in terms of its relationship with Russia, with China and you know, uh, I don't wanna go there. The third one is security. The security committee is the one that I think could do something uh, that could be extremely conservative, I mean, uh, constructive and that is if they focused on the problem of um, militant Uzbeks who have been now forcibly removed from Pakistan by ISI with the help of Afghan government to Northern Afghanistan. They are in the province where I come from in Balakhshan. They are also now present in Takhar. They are present in Faryab and across uh, how many of them there are, we don't know, but there are supposedly uh, up to a couple of thousand armed Central Asian militant so-called Islamists there. That they are people who were not militant. They turned into militancy. They were made because there was no room for them. They have no country to return to. And I think the developments under, during the last three and a half years under President Mirzaev offers a golden opportunity for the United States, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan to help 
solve the problem of militant Central Asians in Northern Afghanistan. And that is, um, there is plenty of relaxation, fortunately. President Mirziyayev has began to dismantle the horrible 1999 laws on religious groups that uh, Islam Karimov had introduced, which turned uh, the country into a prison for Muslim practitioners. Uh, tens of thousands of people were in prison and they have been released. Uh, many thousands of them have been released over the last three and a half years by President Mirziyayev, and there is relaxation. There is uh, also uh, insistence on the part of President Mirziyayev to bring rule of law in the country and to help improve the livelihood of Uzbek citizens in the country through various economic and political and other means. So this is the opportunity to begin a negotiation with this unfortunate victims, really. They are, not, they are not the perpetrators of violence, although they have become instruments for that because in the hands of Taliban, in the hands of Al-Qaeda, in, in the hands of Daesh. But in Afghanistan, we have a golden opportunity to um, create an environment in which they could be invited back to their country, repatriated, and given um, uh, asylum, if you like, ba back to their own country. And this is, this is an opportunity that I think the United States, Afghanistan, and Uzbekistan should not miss, because uh, if they start negotiation with them, they are desperate. They, they are not there because they want to, because they must, they have to. This is a question of survival. And you can approach to, uh, them uh, meaningfully to say, okay, lay your arms down and Uzbekistan is your home, your country welcomes you back. And I think this would solve one of the major issues that concerns Mirziyayev's um, policies at this point. And this, this is a golden opportunity that I hope and I encourage that these three countries will, will do. Instead of uh, killing them, instead of getting rid of them, you can't get rid of them. If you kill more, there will be more to come. We have learned this in the last 20 years of um, terrorism things. It's not war on terror, it's war for terror. And this is what America should have learned a lesson, and I'm not sure whether this country has learned that lesson. But there is an opportunity to turn the clock back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharani. Um, there was a true tour de force, and I think also provided a really good uh, material for the ongoing, uh, for our ongoing discussions. I think two points that I think are really interesting, and I will uh, ask Akram Uramov in a second to, to address this, is uh, a joint narrative uh, and thought work that we need to do on the Afghan and the and the Uzbek side about reconciliation and reintegration of fighters, which I think is something that, of course, has a place in the, in the discussions about the political settlements. Um, because, of course, there are also um, previous fighters that need to have a vision um, or a path towards, uh, towards life, as you described it, um, in Uzbekistan. The question whether the cooperation actually reaches out uh, to these areas, or it ha still has this like, well, pre-learned lesson and the old outlook that you described, seeing them as terrorists and murders and looking through a, a prosecution uh, lens, I think that will be interesting when we discuss uh, the way forward. Uh, Dr. Akram Uram Uram Umarov, he's a senior research fellow at the University of World Economic uh, Economy and Diplomacy in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. And he was also a senior research fellow at the Institute for Strategic and Regional Studies under the president of the Republic of Uzbekistan. Uh, welcome, Akram. I think it's great to have you here uh, with us to maybe A, address the points that were mentioned. Um, I think there's a lot of attention on Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan's activities towards the peace process. Saying it as a German, we're also always competing about the question where, who can host the uh, which parts of, of negotiations, but I think it is visible that the role of, of Uzbekistan, and that was also discussed by the previous panelists, has changed and it's perceived differently. There is an openness, there's a lot of activities, 
a lot of trilateral uh, initiatives. I just read uh, this morning about the Japan, Uzbekistan, uh, Afghanistan trilateral. So there are a lot of institutions um, or initiatives building up. At the same time, Uzbekistan is also part of many forums and regional, uh, regional groups. So if you could first take us back uh, to Tashkent and explain a bit about the, the perspective of the Uzbek government on this new foreign policy, where I think the, the initiative towards Afghanistan is maybe just one, uh, one point. And uh, yeah, tell us a bit about uh, the actual expectations of, of Uzbekistan. We heard a lot about the, um, the potential and the, um, what would be possible. Um, but of course, it would also be interesting uh, what Uzbekistan expects from Afghanistan. Like what would be the Afghan part uh, what would they expect uh, to happen on the Afghan side? What would be a desired outcome of a political settlements? What are the withdrawal of the U.S. was already mentioned, maybe also concerns. So um, the floor is yours to address whichever points uh, you would like. Akram, there you go. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very grateful to you, Magdalena, for moderating this event and also to Afghan Institute for Strategic Studies and its director, Dr. Muradian, for inviting me to this event. So you, you put so many questions, I'll try to cover most of them. Uh, but considering maybe time limits, if I miss some of them, maybe we can continue the discussion on the quick Q&A session maybe. So first of all, of course, uh, the current reproachment between Uzbekistan and Afghanistan has in my view, has a great historic foundation. And Afghanistan, in my view, has always been and will remain an integral part of Central Asia. And the states of Central Asia and Afghanistan have a, have a common history, religion, culture, traditions, as well as common interests in the field of security and trade development. And if you take the history, almost uh, there were many, many cases when Afghanistan and Central Asia were part of single states like Greco, starting from the greco bactrian and Kushan kingdoms and ending with the periods of Timurids and Baburids. And uh, the, this, this area established kind of security complex stretching from the uh, northern regions of modern Kazakhstan and to the coastal regions of uh, modern India. And this historical uh, uh, foundation has, has a great influence on the current developments in the foreign policy of Uzbekistan. And uh, Jan and Professor Shahrani already mentioned about the security angle of Uzbek foreign policy, the priority of security angle in, in its foreign, in Uzbek foreign policy during the pe period of Karimov, uh, sorry, President Karimov. Um, governance and I, I, I agree with this uh, uh, with this view and I think the problem was maybe not only Karimov was so security approach to Afghanistan but it was very similar in, in all Central Asian states there was a huge uh, over securitization of Afghanistan if you look and analyze uh, most of the official speeches or foreign policy concepts of Central Asian countries at that period, in 2000s, in 1990s, almost all these speeches included some security perceptions and the security, uh, the, the declaration of security threats from Afghanistan and assessment of, uh, of Afghanistan as a source of threats and challenges and risks for the Central Asian countries. So, there was a there was a cooperation with Afghanistan, but there were always with the, this thinking of security and trying to isolate Afghanistan and not to uh, to let as as it was perceived at that period, not to let the militants, the drugs, and other security issues cross the borders with a Central Asian states. But uh, of course, the new development, the new foreign policy of Uzbekistan declares that it, it needs cooperation with its neighbors. We cannot choose our neighbors. It's something which was, uh, which was uh, given to us from somewhere else. 
So if we, we should, we have to cooperate with, with all our neighbors. We can, have some, we can have some issues with them, we can have some problems, but it's a reality and we should work with this. So this is more realistic approach to Afghanistan and we feel, I think in Uzbekistan, the current president and the current government feels, feel that they need to increase this called the level of cooperation with Afghanistan. And this, this can help both to Uzbekistan and the both, and also to reconcile the, uh, the conflict in Afghanistan. If we always emphasize on security, if we always emphasize on threats, we will never find the solution for the problem. So we, will, we should try to change our mind and to, to reprioritize our efforts and to pay more attention to peace building and reconciliation in Afghanistan. And what can we do to bring this peace in Afghanistan? Of course, we need to help Afghanistan in, the, in negotiations be, be, uh, between different Afghan political forces. And also the second mo major point uh, to, to help Afghanistan to establish some economic prosperity, to create jobs, to create uh, infrastructure. So without this, we cannot talk about something, some sustainable peace, even there will be, a, the, the, the Afghan sides will agree on some uh, peace, the, it cannot um, be sustainable without all these conditions, about economic development, without infrastructure. So this perception is dominating in Uzbekistan, so you, you, you all know this, uh, the, the, the real outputs of this new foreign policy, including many different initiatives which Uzbekistan, uh, which Uzbekistan become driver, and also the establishment of this uh, educational center in, in the border with Afghanistan and Termes, and also this economic uh, support of Afghanistan and the, the, the will to continue the railroad, which has already reached mazar sharif the, the plans are, to continue this road to till Herat and to till the Pakistani borders. But of course, all these things needs uh, some security guarantees and it's all, um, which is more important, some funding from international financial institutions. So these are the drivers of the current Uzbek uh, foreign policy in Afghanistan. If we briefly talk about the new platform of, Uzbek, uh, of United States, Uzbekistan, and Afghanistan. I think it's very interesting uh, dialect platform and it's very interesting format. And why, why, it, why did it appear? I think there are maybe three, three major fact factors. First, of course, which, which was already mentioned in all official documents, the security angle, again, uh, and as Professor Shahrani mentioned from the speech of Ambassador Wahhabov, there is already one of the important uh, uh, groups which was created under this dialogue platform is, is devoted to the security issues. So there is a will to establish security cooperation between the three sides and to provide security in this transborder area in, of Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. And this includes all the issues of uh, different terrorist groups, drugs, and other crime, uh, crime issues. And this, the second reason, of course, which I already mentioned, the economic issue. We know that uh, this, uh, there is already some platform for regional dialogue, C5 plus one. But in my view, this is more kind of legacy of Obama administration. And the Pompeo and the Trump administration maybe wanted to bring some new, uh, new initiative to, to Central Asia, and they uh, therefore they, they, they initiated this new dialogue and have narrow uh, number of countries discussing more specific issues. And when you have, which was already uh, said by the uh, U.S. State Department officials that. They are trying to have smaller number of countries and to discuss and to implement some specific issues. Not just, we have a lot of, you, many of us already mentioned that the existence of many, many different political platforms, discussion groups, negotiation groups for Afghan, devoted to Afghanistan. But 
The problem with those is groups that we are speaking and discussing too much, but we are doing too little. And these small and narrow groups maybe can bring more tangible results and can bring some real outputs of their uh, cooperation. So, uh, and the United States is declaring that this is the first experiment uh, involving Uzbekistan, and if it, uh, it is successful, they can continue this experiment with creating new platforms with other neighboring Central Asian, uh, neighboring with Afghanistan, Central Asian countries like Tajikistan and Turkmenistan also. And the third uh, factor may be uh, less discussed uh, in, in, the, in media and in other circles, maybe the factor of rationalizing. And there's uh, the agreement between the Taliban and United States, Doha agreement, uh, was assessed by many experts and scholars as a soon abandonment of the United States from Afghanistan. And there was a lot of discussion that uh, Russia again will become the so-called security provider in Central Asia, and that Russia can be the only guarantee of security of Central Asia and, and can defend Central Asia from the possible threats, uh, for possible instability in Afghanistan. So this kind of, the creation of such platforms, I think is very important in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, demonstrating that the, the presence of United States in Afghanistan and Central Asia is, is a long-term phenomenon, and United States is still committed to its, uh, to its responsibility for these uh, issues in, in, in the region, and it, it, it creates some kind of balance, and it, it helps the Central Asian countries to have this more balanced foreign policy and also in terms of this relations with Afghanistan. And very uh, briefly, a couple of recommendations, maybe the, I've already mentioned some of them. So what is important for this platform, which I already mentioned, to have some real outputs. We have a lot of platforms of discussions, but unfortunately the conflict in Afghanistan, the instability in Afghanistan is still going on. So we should, help Afghan um, political forces to talk, to talk with each other, to create some common grounds, and to establish some uh, peace agreement. And we can help this not only by giving some platform to a discussion somewhere in Uzbekistan, in Tashkent, or in Samarkand, but also investing in, in, in Afghan infrastructure and uh, creating some economic opportunities for the Afghan people. And this educational center in Termes can be a very good starting point, maybe. It doesn't need a big enough, uh, the huge funding as, as the construction of railroad, but it can bring very quick and very good outputs. We can train, we can prepare a new generation of Afghan youth, having a very good knowledge and uh, who which are ready and committed to make changes and in inside Afghanistan. So the involvement of uh, the United States, not only by funding the center, but, but also supporting capacity building of this center by uh, bringing new, maybe, uh, maybe new teachers, new specialties, new knowledge to the center can be very important. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, Grateful for this opportunity. I'm looking forward for further discussion. Thank you so much. That was uh, extremely insightful, especially with recommendations so we can get some tangible ideas what we can do while we're waiting for the beginning of, of negotiations, what could be done uh, more than warm words. Um, I would now like to invite uh, our fourth panelist to basically continue with uh, what we started uh, with Akram to look a bit beyond um, just the, the border. Ambassador Janan uh, Mozazai is the perfect uh, uh, speaker for this because a, he's the co-founder and vice president of part of Asia Security a Society. So I think his uh, main profession is to look broad. Um, but he's also uh, an Afghan diplomat. He was formerly the ambassador to the uh, Islamic Republic of Afghanistan's embassy in, in China. 
into Pakistan, which is also interesting because we talked a lot about the North and what's going on, uh, especially with, uh, with potential traditions. But of course, in the South, we have almost a similar uh, discussion, albeit a bit more difficult with more uh, problematic actors. And um, I think especially as, um, as you were posted to China, um, I would be really interesting in your view whether this uh, new trilateral, and I think Akram hinted at it, if you're a, a diplomat in these times, you don't know which uh, meeting to attend first because there's so many initiatives and you probably get confused. Um, that one of the, like, the comments the US government had on the new Central Asia strategy was, now in Central Asia, you can play, is a quote by, by Alice Wells. But is there really a vacuum? Aren't there like, players like China and Russia that have already moved much more forward with their integration and cooperation schemes um, and the ideas and hopes that, um, that the US maybe have are very, very overblown. And of course, uh, as you're now our Kabul uh, the speaker of today, um, what's the view from Kabul on these on this initiative? Is it a worthwhile addition, or is it one more level of mostly declaration and meetings, but not something really tangible for Afghanistan right now? Again, a lot of question. Pick uh, what you would like to address, and I'm really looking forward to your remarks. The floor is yours. Um, just um, yes, perfect. Assalam to uh, to you, Magdalena, to all the panelists, and to our uh, audience uh, online on Facebook, on Twitter. I'm grateful also to the um, Afghanistan Institute for Strategic Studies, to Dr. Muradian and his uh, capable team for including me in this um, excellent discussion. And it's a privilege uh, always to uh, to be speaking on the same panel as uh, Professor Shahrani, for whom. We all have tremendous uh, respect here in Afghanistan. Um, I think, uh, but I so completely agree with all the, uh, the previous speakers that the, uh, the shift, the change in Afghanistan-Uzbekistan relations is just breathtaking. Uh, what has occurred in the past four years or um, uh, around four years is uh, completely unprecedented. It's, um, extremely significant. Uh, and just to illustrate from my uh, personal experience, uh, I went to Uzbekistan, I actually applied uh, for an Uzbek visa for the first time in 2003, when I was a student uh, at the time at the American University of Central Asia in Bishkek, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, my visa application was rejected and I understood the reasons. But then in 2016, uh, again, because of the, the security lens that was dominant uh, in how Uzbekistan looked at its neighbors at the time. But in 2016, I had the opportunity to go back to, to go to Tashkent for the first time as um, I was ambassador at the time in Beijing, but because uh, Uzbekistan was hosting the Shanghai Cooperation Organization Summit, uh, I was invited, I was included to attend the bilateral meetings between our president and the Chinese president, but I obviously used the time to go around Tashkent and the tenor of the discussions and what you heard about what was happening in Uzbekistan, uh, this was a time when former President Karimov was still alive and he hosted that summit. That, the tenor of that discussion and what you heard from people both people in government, but also people out on the streets, compared to uh, when I went to Uzbekistan for the second time, which was in March of 2019 of last year, when I took uh, my family to Uzbekistan for a vacation, we went to Tashkent, Urgench, Kheva, Bukhara, Samarkand, um, and uh, the north of Tashkent, is completely, uh, I mean, it, incomparable. The openness with, with which we were received in 2019, the, the large number of foreign tourists that we encountered in every, not just in every city, but in, uh, on pretty much every street and in every neighborhood and, in, and, and restaurants was incredible. Uh, so I think uh, what this means is that uh, there, the change in Uzbekistan is real. Um, and uh, we should also, I think, give credit to the leadership in Afghanistan because uh, Afghan, uh, the Afghan government, both under President Karzai and also under President uh, Shafani, 
have made uh, concerted efforts to expand relations with Central Asia and especially with Uzbekistan. So I think uh, confidence building has now taken place between the two sides. And this is the right time uh, to look at some uh, important, significant initiatives that would expand and deepen bilateral relations and bilateral cooperation, but also uh, Afghanistan and, uh, allow Afghanistan and Uzbekistan to take ownership of uh, uh, initiatives on regional economic integration and uh, connectivity. So I think that's one area where uh, I could maybe make an early suggestion is for uh, is the importance for Uzbekistan and Afghanistan to really prioritize this trilateral cooperation to uh, uh, allocate the necessary resources to making it a success so that they drive this initiative. Yes, it's, it was a good idea. Uh, yes, the Amer it was the Americans who suggested it. And uh, we should thank them for that. But it should be Afghanistan and Uzbekistan that should drive this initiative. So it should be driven from Kabul and Tashkent first, and then uh, 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 from Washington, D.C. But even there, uh, the embassies of Afghanistan and Uzbekistan have to be very active partners in pushing this initiative forward. I wanted to uh, put two concrete uh, suggestions on, on the table uh, for this panel, uh, and that's uh, related to um, uh, Central Asia, South Asia connectivity through Afghanistan. Uh, there are three committees, as Professor Shahrani pointed out, under the new trilateral, security, political, and economic, uh, and the suggestion basically is uh, for the economic committee to focus on uh, connectivity between Central Asia and South Asia. And this fits both with the Built and Road Initiative that the Chinese have proposed, and also with the strategy that the uh, United States has outlined for connectivity between Central Asia and South Asia. Um, obviously, the fact that uh, Dr. Khalil Zad, the US Special Envoy for Afghan Peace, uh, took along with himself the head of the uh, United States International Development Finance Corporation on his recent uh, tour of the region, including uh, two Central Asian uh, capitals, was significant. I think the two countries can work together to maybe seek uh, US support in terms of financing for infrastructure projects, uh, including especially railway that uh, 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 Professor Omarov uh, pointed out, uh, Uzbekistan is the only country so far that has actually taken the practical step of building a railway connection from Hairatan to mazar sharif and that can be extended all the way to Pakistan and to Gwadar and, um, actually, and uh, realize the uh, vision of uh, connectivity between the two regions. So that's in the infrastructure area, railways and roads, and there you need close government-to-government -government cooperation. So perhaps uh, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan could uh, expand this trilateral uh, to include Pakistan, uh, specifically focused on connectivity. The second area would be investment, trade, and the trade. Again, in the economic domain. And here, uh, uh, something that um, I think not a lot of people have paid attention to, and it's a tremendous uh, uh, capability that needs to be utilized, is uh, the presence and uh, experience of large American contractors, large American companies uh, in Afghanistan that in the, over the past 20 years have uh, gained tremendous experience in working with, uh, yes, with the US military, with NATO, but also with the Afghan National Security and Defense Forces, with uh, other Afghan government departments. But they have gained a, a very rich experience of global supply uh, chain management and also shipping and tracking in um, the Caucasus region, Central Asia, South Asia, the NDN was mentioned earlier by Professor Mutazashvili. And uh, we know that there are uh, some of these companies are very keenly interested in diversifying into uh, the commercial sectors of Afghanistan, of Central Asian republics, and uh, of countries in South Asia, especially Pakistan. So um, I think it's uh, the Economic Committee could perhaps uh, include a discussion or start a discussion on extending the Afghanistan-Pakistan transit trade agreement to Central Asia, start, starting with Uzbekistan.
um, and, uh, and, and look at the practicalities of uh, making that happen and then utilizing uh, the capabilities of large multi-billion dollar U.S. companies that know the region, that are interested in uh, diversifying away from uh, U.S. military contracting to working in the commercial sectors in these countries. So I'll, uh, I'll stop with that and then I'm um, happy to address any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I also have to applaud the panelists for being like the most uh, positive uh, panel that I've heard uh, in the Afghan context uh, in a while, um, which is very good because I think it's important to know where you want to land at and what you want to achieve. And I think that's, uh, that's extremely important. However, I would like to put some water uh, in the wine um, and maybe kick off the discussion. We have like some 25 uh, minutes left. So if you of course have, have questions, um, I also like to, to take you up on this, but then maybe I'll start to, and go right back to you, uh, Ambassador Mozazai, because you elegantly skipped uh, my question about China and, to, and what do other extra regional, um, regional players actually have in mind. Um, because I think what's uh, really interesting and of course affordable is that everybody supports peace, everybody supports stability and everybody supports connectivity. Um, but how realistic um, is it that this can be done without further conflict um, and ruptures that of course could then be deterring uh, the investors and potential supporters that you mentioned in an environment that is gross, um, growingly polarizing. And uh, maybe a second point um, also to, to the other panelists, whoever wants to address, 99% um, of your suggestions uh, re require the, uh, the, the sentence, once there is a political settlement and stability in Afghanistan. So we can, I think, agree that we are not at the at the stage yet where we can actually like move forward with all these projects, what of what what could be done right now? Maybe even to create incentives for the conflict parties to come to the table from Uzbekistan, from the U.S. and or other powers. So I would give go back to you, uh, Ambassador Mozazai. Then Jen has um, a question. Whoever wants to chip in, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there, there are two points that I, uh, I, I think I can address uh, in the questions that you posed. First is that in terms of the practicality of, uh, working, with, uh, of working in the trade and transit trade arena is the, the fact that at least one of these major American uh, companies have already entered the Uzbekistan market. They have established themselves and they are even starting to uh, uh, to export products from Uzbekistan to Afghanistan, to supply products from Uzbekistan to Afghanistan, instead of bringing in those supplies and those products from um, farther afield, even as far away as the United States or Europe. Uh, so this is, this is a very practical suggestion and it just needs to mm -hmm. be scaled up and extended to other countries. The second, the, your question on, on China, uh, I think Uzbekistan has always demonstrated an independent foreign policy, as again, Professor Mustafa really was pointing out, the multi-victored uh, uh, nature of Uzbekistan's foreign policy means that it's open to engaging with multiple uh, uh, partners, multiple interlocutors, but you also have an element of balancing in uh, a multi-victored foreign policy. Uh, Uzbekistan has, as we all know, a deep relationship with Russia. That's undeniable. Um, even today, most Uzbeks can speak Russian, and, and that's not something insignificant. China has made uh, massive investments across Central Asia, including in Uzbekistan, and that's a very close and growing relationship between the two countries. But I also know for a fact from a study of, uh, of the changes that have occurred in Uzbekistan over the past four years, that the, uh, that the government in Uzbekistan, under the leadership of President Mirziyayev, is very keen for uh, closer uh, ties with the West, especially in the area of economic cooperation, investment, trade, the transfer of technology, uh, transit trade, uh, and all the rest. And this is where you have, it's not a gap, but it's an opening. It's an opportunity 
for Afghanistan and Uzbekistan to work together and to then work with Pakistan and work with these um, uh, uh, you know, large companies whose engagement is required to realize um, big infrastructure projects, but also to realize um, uh, you know, programs and plans for the development of the uh, industrial sector in Afghanistan, for example, um, and uh, upgrading uh, industry in, in, in Uzbekistan and the rest. So I think it's, there is room for, for everybody China mm -hmm. is already a big player in the, um, uh, in, in the economic arena. Russia has its own uh, space and place. And um, Afghanistan and Uzbekistan, both, they are keen to bring in um, uh, economic players from outside the region, and that should be welcomed. That's a really good point. I think it's also interesting that this multi-vector um, foreign policy could also be a model for for Afghanistan to emulate as it will face certain uh, similar pressures, right? Afghanistan, if I may, Afghanistan is already, sure. um, um, you know, uh, crafting uh, its own uh, foreign policy, uh, updating and upgrading its own foreign policy. And the president has talked about this and Foreign Minister Hanif Atmar has talked about uh, mul a multi-alignment, a foreign policy based on the principle of multi-alignment. And I think that's very similar to what um, Uzbekistan has had for many, many years. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Jen, you had a question, and then I'll have a question for you, but you go ahead first. We have you back. Okay, thank you. Um, these are fantastic comments. Um, and, you know, just to sort of going back to um, Ambassador Mosazai, uh, you know, he brought up this issue of China and Russia, and we're seeing all of this together. I think it's very positive sum, and we are seeing some changes in U.S. foreign policy recently that doesn't necessarily see relations, for example, with China as positive sum. There's lots of zero-sum relations in terms of relations with Russia, relations with China. We haven't really discussed how these two countries fit into that broader political environment. And that is actually not so dependent on the results of the peace process. So that would be just a question for all of you. And then a second question, actually, uh, for Professor Shahrani is, you know, many people in um, the U.S., when you bring up this question of foreign fighters, Uzbek fighters inside of Afghanistan, they'll say, oh, this is just an exaggeration. This isn't real. This was used to, uh, and in fact, in, in the 90s and in the 2000s when I was living in Uzbekistan, there were many people who said, oh, this IMU isn't real. It's just used by the government of Uzbekistan to get more security assistance, um, that these foreign fighters are really a very small phenomena. We focus on them. We maybe exaggerate their size and numbers. And I was just curious um, how you'd respond to that. Because there's so little we know, actually. About we start with this question, and then okay. we go back to the the connection between the peace process and uh, and the prospects for cooperation. So, Dr. Sharani? Jen, uh, as I mentioned, their numbers are not um, well established, but their presence is absolutely true. Um, we know firsthand that they, there are Central Asian uh, militant fighters transferred purposefully by ISI and the Afghan government to take the war from the south to the north since 2015. This is not anything that could be disputed. There are plenty of evidence that Afghan government, Kabul regimes have had a hand in doing this and that um, they are in the process of probably recruiting more unhappy people who are being driven out of Central Asian republics because of oppressive policies of some other countries. Fortunately, as I suggested, Uzbekistan has uh, changed, shifted its policies, and that's why there is, a, there is an opening to do that. Uh, you're, you're right, um, you know, governments uh, is certainly Karimov, um, there was huge exaggerations and justification of his own policies 
in terms of what was going on in Afghanistan. And that's not exaggeration. What's going on in Afghanistan is horrible. It has destabilized the whole area. It has uh, made a mess of the country. I mean, these are not things that we can uh, ignore. Um, exaggeration or no exaggeration, uh, the policies of uh, Kabul regime in the last 20 years, um, both uh, within the country as well as um, uh, against northern neighbors, has been horrible, abusive. And, and um, I don't see anything really positive. It's uh, the Uzbek government is in, in a particularly unique situation in Central Asia to have an independent policy and particularly Mirziyayev has made a, a better sense of you know, what he could do constructively. This is the only country that does not, in Central Asia, does not have a direct uh, border with Russia. It does not have a direct border with China. And it has uh, the largest population, the most educated population, and the most uh, developed uh, country in terms of its infra you know, t uh, technical capabilities and in, in otherwise. And it's not as rich as Kazakhstan, but it, ha it is not a dependent country. Um, yes, there are some, some um, uh, migrant laborers going to Russia because of um, employment situation within Uzbekistan, but I think Uzbeks have a very good chance of uh, improving that in the near future, near future so that Uzbekistan can, in fact, if have a, uh, has a positive policy towards Afghanistan in terms of uh, building infrastructure for Afghans, doing development and so on, uh, is, is a very um, um, good move. But will Kabul be able to uh, contribute to that positively, especially with, with, uh, with the Taliban uh, war that goes on and there is very little um, potential for its, uh, for its end because Kabul regime is uh, in, in a lot of ways shares the, the, the same policies and the same views and the same goals as Taliban. And we need to, we still don't have a, a very clear definition of our enemy within Afghanistan. When we reach that point where we honestly can distinguish between who is, uh, who are our, our foes and who are our friends, then maybe we'll have a better sense of what is, um, what Uzbekistan could do for us. The Tirmid Center, uh, yes, it started with very, very good hopeful note, but unfortunately it has been a disaster. You, you be, remember, it started initially as a way of supporting the Uzbek language and literature, teaching and pedagogy in Afghanistan. And guess who ended up in uh, getting those scholarships to go to Tirmiz? People who, who had no knowledge of the language, no interest in the language. It was just a, a, something that was available there and it had to be given to somebody's relatives or friends or, or uh, co-ethnics or whatever. So it hasn't produced the results, unfortunately, from what I know of training Uzbek teachers, Uzbek language instructors that could in fact remedy the lack of Uzbek language education amongst the Uzbeks in Afghanistan. And, and the government of Afghanistan's policies towards the Uzbek and Turkic pop, uh, population has been uh, the most horrible, um, abusive. Look of what they have been doing with, with um, you know, uh, leaders of, of the Uzbek community, that they are the only ones who have been, uh, uh, you know, pointed out is the warlords, is the criminal, is this and that. And there are no criminals among the Taliban. There are no criminals in, in Haqqani group. There are no criminals in a lot of other groups. There is no honesty in the country. That's what we need. And I think when Afghanistan's governments become honest and, and Uzbeks are trying to be honest for a change, I think then there will be some, something positive coming out of that without that trust, without that, that, that uh, uh, reliable um, uh, principle behavior. I don't think Afghanistan is going to get out of its mess anytime soon. And uh, there is, as I, as I said, for the militants, even if they're few, they are pro posing a threat in northern Afghanistan. It, dis it has destabilized northern Afghanistan for the last five years in the worst manner. And Taliban, of course, in Daesh are amongst them. But 
there's poverty, there's a lot of other things that, that goes on that are not addressed. So this problem needs to be addressed. And if it can be addressed peacefully with the help of Uzbekistan and the United States with a changed attitude to see if these militants, uh, including some of the Afghans who have joined the Taliban, so-called Taliban or Daesh, that it's out of poverty, it's, it's out of misery, it's out of necessity. These are victims. We need to look at them as victims and as such try to come up with solutions that would help bring about a, 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 a real change in the area. Thank you. I think that's also a good point because we have seen from certain, uh, from recent attacks also in Kabul that the Doha agreement by itself is not the last step uh, to remove terrorism from the, the agenda in, in Afghanistan. And I think that's a good point also what uh, Ambassador Mozazaya said, there has to be like an Uzbek-Afghan dialogue, not necessarily only facilitated uh, by the U.S., but, uh, but also a joint understanding. And Maybe Akram, I could ask you to also give us your view on what, uh, what Dr. Sharani just said, because I think uh, it's interesting to me that you all emphasize the importance of people to people exchange and trust and understanding in the populations, but the initiatives are mostly government to government. So who are, if we want to write a good story about de-radicalization on both sides of the border and, um, and really turn these victims into like uh, full parts of the societies again, who should we reach out to? Or do you think the government-to-government -government track is, is successful here? Uh, thank you very much for this question. It's a bit complicated. I think we have just, we, just have, we have recently just started this government-to-government -government cooperation. And the next step will be this people-to-people -people interaction. And this Thermes uh, Educational Center is, 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 is as an attempt of this increased people-to-people -people cooperation. And yes, maybe there are some problems which uh, Professor Shahrani mentioned. I, I'm not, uh, I, I don't have full information about this, but even if there are such problems, we should work on the elimination of them. We should work on these issues. We should maybe expand our cooperation. And also this maybe, as I know, there's this Selection of these candidates from the Afghan side is is is, is uh, as a duty of Afghan uh, government. So, if we try to intervene in this, it can be negatively perceived by the Afghan government. So we are bringing this opportunity that we are ready to uh, to educate Afghan youth. And now this center is not limited only with Uzbek language and literature teaching, but now it's it, it expanded its uh, trainings, uh, including some railway sp sp professionals, uh, healthcare sp sphere professionals, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and we can expand this also maybe for some public policy issue uh, spheres and etc. So there is much um, there is much room for doing something together, and we can discuss more these issues together. And I would like to briefly comment the, the role of China, maybe. I think it's a very interesting issue. And now we are, of course, we're observing this the strange relationship between China and Russia, uh, between China and United States. But maybe Afghanistan can be a very good uh, point for, make, for, for finding some common uh, grounds for them. Again, Uzbekistan also has very good experience of bringing on the same negotiation table uh, the other countries which have which had very complex relations, like in 1990s, uh, the Iran and United States, and recently in, in 2018 conference again, many different high, uh, countries sent their high level representatives, including Iranian and Chinese counterparts. So uh, the, the Professor Shahrani mentioned very correctly, saying this unique position of Uzbekistan. Besides its geographic position, I think the unique position of Uzbekistan includes a trustful and good relations with all, with all the important actors in Afghanistan, including Pakistan, including Iran, and other, and China, and etc. So we can bring for example, China 
to discuss uh, Chinese, for example, funding and investment in these infrastructure projects, which can uh, go in line with Chinese interests in, in, in the implementation of Belt and Road Initiative in this Eurasian continent. And Afghanistan is now this missing point in this initiative and there's like white hole, but the, this uh, Chinese, in, uh, con Chinese government can, can bring this uh, funding maybe to this infrastructure projects, which is in their interest also. Thank you. I like you. The, still the optimist uh, uh, version of this, <laughs> this panel. Um, as we have only five minutes left, I would like to give everyone uh, the opportunity for a last remark and throw in uh, like a, a question myself, but it can be a one word answer. Now that everything is kind of uh, in shambles with COVID, what are the things that we need to like still invest and still work towards in this like trilateral relationship? Um, even when the pandemic is like uh, throwing all our schedules uh, throughout. Uh, Jen, you go first. Um, thank you. This was a fantastic discussion and I learned so much from all of you. Um, you know, in terms of going forward, I think Akram uh, hit the nail on the head in terms of expanding these kinds of opportunities for people to people exchanges. There's so much uncertainty right now in Afghanistan about what's going to happen in the peace process. It's hard to make investments based on this very uncertain outcome right now, right? And we haven't really talked a lot about uh, what that will look like. And I think Professor Shahrani has mentioned, you know, this trust in the government really remains an open question uh, for how, and, and you see the government of Uzbekistan really trying to work with all players also as a way to hedge the future because of this uncertainty. So increasing the kinds of people to people exchanges, increasing opportunities for education. Yesterday, I was talking with a scholar from Uzbekistan who reached out to me saying, do you think that the US would be willing to support a university to bring Afghans to Uzbekistan to study? Right? Many Afghans had their formative experiences in Iran and in Pakistan. And they looked to those countries in some ways as models because that's where their experiences were. Or they looked to them with disdain because that's where their experiences were. And I think Uzbekistan can become a model in many ways and is becoming, you know, Ambassador Musazai, he, he spoke about his travels, how surprised he was um, at the changes taking place. I also um, had a visa denied many years ago in, in Uzbekistan and seeing the changes that have taken place has just been remarkable. And um, having this country serve potentially as some kind of beacon for future cooperation but amongst peoples, forget about the governments, but amongst peoples, I think that there is enormous hope. Um, so that's where I would leave things. Thank you so much. Ambassador Mozazai, what's the key priority? Well, people, the people definitely, but I, but I think that's not really a very difficult area because uh, the people of Afghanistan and Uzbekistan uh, have you know, millennia of uh, uh, ties and, and, and close relationships. Uh, but it is, it is a priority. Uh, thousands of Afghan students were trained in Uzbekistan in the 1970s, uh, 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, many of whom are still um, in important positions here in Afghanistan. Uh, but I think the focus really should be on the uh, economic dimension of cooperation, because if you uh, neglect that, then you will continue to securitize and militarize the discussion uh, around the bilateral as well as the, the regional uh, dimension of relations. Thank you so much. Dr. Sharani. Well, I think um, Uzbekistan has its own opportunities and I hope that they will be able to um, take advantage of that and do good for themselves. But they're not going to be able to solve Afghanistan's problem. Nobody is going to solve Afghanistan's problem. And unless and until we have the kind of governance system in a country that um, reflects the wishes and hopes of our own people. There is a huge separation between the people and the government in Afghanistan. And this was the case in Uzbekistan, but I think the gap has been closing there. So we need to listen. But I wanted to also make a, a point about China. I think China's miserable policies towards the Uyghurs and to Muslims in general in China is something that the countries in the region need to take a note of, that they are deceptive. America is beginning to realize 
that they are taking advantage and that they are on, on a policy uh, pursuit that is China-centered and nothing else. They don't give a damn about the consequences of their policies in the region. And I think that this uh, one road and, and built uh, system is also a fraudulent uh, system that in the long run, it's a threat to the region and the region need to be um, careful of their relationship with China and China's investment in, in all the rest. So that's, that's a much larger issue. But in terms of Afghanistan, United States and Uzbekistan, there are some opportunities. And the first opportunity is for Afghanistan to, to fix its own miserable problems. And then um, something could be done. But on my suggestion for the, for the militants in Central Asia, I don't think you need peace in Afghanistan first. That's something that is part of the problem and could be done simultaneously to, to try to approach and see if a solution could be uh, found so that Central Asian militants get out of Northern Afghanistan back into their own country, uh, home countries. And then at least Northern Afghanistan gets back to uh, some kind of a relative uh, a peace uh, without, of course, Taliban and others in the government wouldn't allow that, but, but uh, w one hopes that that will become the case and that Uzbekistan would play a constructive role in that by solving its own militant problem in northern Afghanistan and then um, helping the Afghans. Thank you. Akram, now you have the difficult job of both addressing uh, this point and uh, being the, last, uh, the owner of the last word on the panel. So where do you think should be the priorities also from the Uzbek side? Very briefly, uh, my reaction to the comments of Professor Shahrani regarding the militants uh, from, from the Central Asian countries in Afghanistan. In Uzbekistan specifically, there is a state program of reintegration of such militants if they haven't committed very bad crimes like killings. So they can be uh, the, the government can implement an act of grace and try to reintegrate them in the society. So they can use this opportunity. And my brief, some last words, uh, maybe two, two things which I'd like to underline again. Interactions in all, on all levels, government to government, people to people, expansion of these interactions and expansion of economic cooperation with real outputs. So thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, that was very impressive. Um, I think we all learned a lot, uh, not only me, but uh, I'm extremely thankful for this uh, to the panel and of course to, to AISS for raising this issue and also generating so much food for thought for future encounters. So I think this will not be the last time that we will be dis uh, discussing this. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think we have collected extremely important uh, recommendation and points to move forward for all parties and also show that not only we can learn from each other but also the countries uh, can actually make use of the many the millennials of uh, shared neighborhood um, and also for the US I think there is certainly a lot of things to learn and at least what I understood from from your comments it, is that this is not just a paper tiger I think that is certainly something worth exploring while making sure that it finds its place uh, in the region and serves the interests, especially of Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone who joined in. Um, we hope to see you soon. And I wish you a really nice well, evening in Afghanistan, a morning uh, in the US, and uh, well, the rest of the day for the in-betweens. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.